uh, uh, in terms of Old Man Winter, uh, we also have Old Man Bill Gross, who's uh, taking a page out of Hidden Lover's Notebook, I guess, and trying to be cool in the financial industry, and he's not. So, uh, you know, he's not only is he losing it, but uh, his he has record outflows out of PIMCO funds. So, you know, if you are involved in PIMCO or you do believe in him, <clears throat> just know that a lot of people are exiting the building, and um, that's that. <clears throat> it's hard to it's hard to once once that tide goes one way, it's really hard to correct it. So just know that if you have clients in PIMCO funds. Uh, big market crash in Dubai. They're down 30, uh, 25 to 30 percent uh, past two weeks. So you know, although all things are rosy and uh, we kind of have this perma uh, bullishness uh, in the United States, that isn't worldwide. Uh, although there are U.S. markets and Europe markets have done well, uh, Dubai is still crashing. Um, hasn't really recovered from 2008, and now it's uh, you know exacerbated there. Uh, in terms of interest rates, uh, we had a divergence uh, across the pond. Uh, United Kingdom uh, raised rates, and the EU lowered them. EU lowered them to sub-zero levels. So now, along with Japan um, and the United States, uh, they are facing some serious uh, deflationary uh, pressure. And so you see that there. The divergence, though, is that you know the UK is the first to raise. And so, uh, and also on that note, you know we just got note today from uh, one of the Fed governors that Q1 we'd see a rate hike. Actually, he didn't say Q1. What he said was early 2015. So, um, you know, the picture of Urkel will remind you uh, that a rate hike is maybe not far away. So that's what sent markets down earlier today, but they have recovered. Um, you had to work there. that Urkel in there, right? <laughs> well, it was either that or somebody with a wedgie. <laughs> yeah, it was a it was a quick scare and re recovery today with the uh, with uh, Fed Governor Bullard's <laughs> comments on the uh, possibility of an earlier rate hike. But uh, seems like the market is uh, Teflon coated for the moment, and so got most of it back by the end of the day. We do have that end of QE scenario on site, uh, but you know that has been started that has been largely baked into the cake. If you go to it now, right? Uh, well, continuing in terms of. Uh, update and uh, and looking at the macro snapshot where we, we look at multiple different hidden levers charts to take stock. I uh, want to talk about that GDP number some more and that's our top left chart here today. Now uh, what I wanted to emphasize here is that on hidden levers the primary GDP number that we show, you know, if you were to chart GDP is not actually uh, exactly the same as that headline number that you'll often see uh, you know, published, or that you always see published, like, for instance, the minus 2.9% revision for Q1. Uh, the reason for that is that the quarterly numbers can be very volatile, and they don't always do the best job of capturing, you know, what the real longer-term trend is. Uh, sometimes they can swing sharply negative, then sharply positive, you know, it's, uh, you know, and that's not necessarily indicative of, of where the economy is really going. Uh, the number that we are showing here in the blue line, so this is GDP on a uh, annual percentage basis and so what is the growth from a year ago today you know end of each quarter so still quarterly data points but just GDP growth as measured or real GDP growth as measured from uh, exactly 12 months prior uh, doing it that way actually has some advantages in that you don't have to seasonally adjust the numbers you're always comparing for instance March 31 2014 to March 31 2013 uh, and so there's a natural seasonal adjustment when you do year-over-year -year comparisons where when they do the standard quarterly numbers, they put in these seasonal adjustment factors. They try to guesstimate, you know, oh, how bad was the winter? Or, you know, what should the, you know, what was Christmas like, and so on. And those fudge factors actually cause some of the volatility, you know, leading to the minus 2.9. Where you'll see the broader of the trend that we have shows that in fact growth came down, uh, but down into the mid ones, not you know, it, not recession level territory, which is what minus 2.9 is. I mean, if if we were really you know, reeling in that way, uh, things would probably feel a lot worse, both market-wise and economy-wise, than uh, than they do. So, just to, like other things, people tend to read just that headline number and say, "Oh, we're we're in a recession." Right, right. And so, just wanted to point that out. And and so, if you look at the GDP numbers on on uh, hidden levers, you'll see that 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 is what that delta is about. Uh, talking about uh, some other positive numbers, U.S. home prices and housing starts. This is over the last five years. So, uh, back essentially to the, the pit of the recession uh, in early mid 2009 
Uh, housing prices, of course, bottomed uh, much more recently than that, not until early 2012. And then it's been almost a straight line upward for home prices, as you can see there. Housing starts are more volatile. Of course, they're going to uh, decline a little bit, and there's going to be some seasonality in them. But, uh, but generally, a strong uptrend there as well. So uh, that's positive news. Maybe building off that positive news, that's the chart on the bottom left. This is looking at U.S. corporate bond spreads and high-yield bond spreads. And you'll notice, of course, we put them – this is on two scales. It's not like high-yield and corporate bond spreads are exactly the same. Uh, and actually, I want to make a comment about that for a moment. If we look at where these lines are, so 6% or even 5% on the corporate bond side equates to almost 20% in terms of spread on the high-yield side. So high-yield bonds are definitely, definitely the leveraged play here. Uh, particularly when the market spikes up for yields on high yield to have gone into the mid 20s when yields on corporates never went above really 6%. You know that that shows you just how much more risk the market is um, in bad times is looking at with high yield. Uh but but here's the other story here that's that today we are down basically on on bond spreads down to pre-recession boom time levels. So maybe it doesn't feel exactly like boom times today, but the bond market certainly thinks that it's boom times. And uh, jump past it. But and what I mean there is, is that, and this is not talking about the the absolute level of interest rates. This is just talking about the spread above treasuries. So uh, canceling out, you know, any rise or, or fall in interest rates. Uh, the risk premium for bonds, for corporate bonds, has hasn't been lower in seven years. Final chart. Uh, for this month is gold and silver. Uh, wanted, of course, you know you're all familiar with the fact that gold bounced and has been rising steadily. That's the uh, blue line there. Since uh, really early uh, in the month, we've had a nice little rally, and some of this may be geopolitically driven. Uh, but I wanted to take this as an opportunity to talk about the gold-silver relationship. We've mentioned before how silver is essentially gold's more volatile cousin, and uh, and you can see that here. With every drop, silver is dropping more. And then even recently, we can see that over the time period in question, silver is actually up five, you know, over 5%, whereas gold is up only – actually, it's only fractionally positive. So a big margin, around four, four percentage points in, in additional performance. That cuts both ways, of course, but, but silver, again, that, that's just an illustration of the volatility you get. Um, so uh, for those among you that are looking for a leverage play on – on uh, precious metals, silver is your is your metal of choice. All right, let's talk now a little bit about the Middle East turmoil. This month's topic, and specifically about scenarios. All right, we don't want to get too much into you know all the the drama going on over there. There's enough uh, press that you can read about that on your own. Um, but uh, you know, to to outline what. To get rid of the confusion, it's important to know who the players are. We're not talking about an anti-U.S. insurgency here. We're not talking about um, uh, you know, Kuwait and Iraq here. We're talking about somewhere in the north of Iraq and parts of Syria, there is a, a lot of similarly minded people wanting to have their own country, basically. And that is called, uh, that, they call that the Islamic State of Iran and Syria. And so where, you know, who are Iraq these people? And Syria. Oh, sorry, Iraq and Syria. I'm getting confused myself. Um, you know, who, who are these people and why they want that or uh, what kind of legitimacy do they have? We thought we'd make a nice chart and kind of put them in context. Uh, the y-axis there just means, you know, are they closer to democracy or closer to uh, kind of a dictatorship type feeling? And then the, the x-axis, the, that kind of latitudinal line there is, you know, on, on the left, are they toward more the extremist side and more – or to the right, more legit government organization. Um, so you, you can see there on the bottom right, you know, where uh, the American political parties lie. The Tea Party is a little bit, uh, a little bit more extremist than um, the GOP or Dems, but you know, very much in the democratic uh, quadrant, right? That democratic half. You can see there, China government far authoritarian and very much a legit government. So, so to give context to what that is. Um, the the Iraq government there, okay. Am I boring you, Praveen? Uh, sorry, itchy finger. <laughs> so the the Iraq government itself, you know, which is its its position is tenuous. I mean, it's not exactly Cuba 1959 yet, 
but it is it's losing steam it's you know they're just losing soldiers and a lot of their people they're losing the faith of the people um, because they have marginalized so many people in the, in the country um, not just the folks living in ISIS I guess uh, but they're you know they are a legit government relatively but uh, still a little bit more authoritarian and so you know right under African warlords way in the top left corner you can you can get a sense of where ISIS lives and you know really kind of anarchist in general uh, even to the point where the you know folks that uh, red-blooded Americans would consider anarchists people like Al Qaeda and Taliban they've they've excommunicated them from their ranks you know so what if the devil excommunicated people because they were so bad that is ISIS <laughs> and that's where they stand yeah Al Qaeda there. actually said that ISIS was embarrassing them by uh, putting like on YouTube and other places so many of the headings and uh, and they chop off folks' hands, you know, for minor infractions. So all that sort of stuff was they. Al Qaeda felt they had gone overboard. Yeah, Al Qaeda said they went too far. And that's funny, but it is. I mean, it is what it is. So that that's where ISIS stands in terms of legitimacy, none, and extremism, tons of it. Uh, and uh, you know where where they stand. If, they're nowhere near forming a political party or anything like that. So uh, you know, is it going to be? Is are they going to succeed? Uh, hopefully, hopefully not. Um, you know, now what does it look like uh, in terms of the good, bad, ugly? So we thought we'd try and take these, this thought experiment and start with the best possible scenario if, if we can contain that word. Now we're not looking for peace in Iraq. I mean, that's a pipe dream. We're just looking for it doesn't matter to oil prices. It doesn't matter to markets. They can go on. It's a contained explosion in a, its own box, not affecting first world markets. So, you know, for, for whatever heartlessness that has on the humanitarian side, this conversation is about how things are affecting markets in your clients portfolio so so bear with me on that um, you know in terms of where we see oil going down to if if um, if there is a containment of this war the sectarian warfare then probably back down to this $95 level that's it it's this uptick has been largely due to that you know you see the burn off from um, uh, from in, into the winter you see a little bit of a pickup in for the Russia Ukraine situation but but only into the low 100s. So you know from now around 110 uh, or 106, it's still not that high. So back down to 95. A lot of support at that level. Okay. And what does that look like? Well, if the if if the extremists don't have the oil fields, you know, if you don't see a lot of pictures of burning oil fields, then we're in good shape for oil selling off. If the United States stays pretty diplomatic, you know, if they if they don't do anything violent, whether it's a drone. Or whether it's a um, it's a it's a human doing it. If they just stay diplomatic, uh, as the UK has promised to do, right? They have just as much uh, interest there. If they if they stay diplomatic, then we're looking good for a contained war, uh, and that's good. You know, Iran wants that, U.S. wants that, Syria wants that. So there's a more likelihood because you know these people that are not they're not friends, right? Iran and the U.S. and Syria. But if they all want the same thing. Then hopefully that stability can remain. And where oil prices are today, uh, we are still we are still looking at this as a possibility. Uh, but again, the, the main thing is you, it's it's a civil war, not an anti-U.S. insurgency. And so that war contained has nothing to do with uh, you know it's not like they're they're fighting because they hate us. Okay, so a, a little bad scenario here. That would be, um, you know, not all-out chaos. But if the U.S. did strike, there would definitely be tensions raised. Uh, we see oil here going above the Arab Spring high. That was about 113. In the, um, you can see that in in 2011. Uh, and so that M top from Egypt and Libya that came crashing down. Maybe we would pierce that around 115 dollars. Uh, you know, just to get out all the weak hands, all the options activity at 113, probably gets to 115 if, if there is a strike. Um, we know that Israel won't be involved. This has really nothing to do with Israel. Uh, in fact, if, if you remember the LAPD, you know, probably they were, I mean, they didn't do that much about black on black crime. So for Israel, this is a similar story. Uh, it's uh, infighting amongst, uh, amongst Muslims in the Middle East, not, not their fight. And so they'll just watch it happen. Uh, like other people watch World Cup, so in terms of what, if we did that, you know, though it, probably this U.S. strike should it shouldn't happen. The main reason is because 
uh, the relationship with Iran has been so much better since uh, Ahmadinejad left, and so we have that detente, you know, this cooling of of um, of relations, big time. I mean, there's much more travel to Iran nowadays, uh, uh, you know, infinitely more than there was anyway, and and there are um, you know oil prices haven't spiked to those to those 2000. Uh, eight highs when you know we had a uh, uh, Bush in, in in the presidency and and kind of just a real real butting of heads with Iran, um, you know that that made made oil go up kind of in that 2007 Christmas time. Uh, in any case, if any overt action here now would really put that in jeopardy, I'm not talking about something that looks like a proxy war that we had with Russia and Afghanistan, but definitely you know it, it's it's moving away from that stability. So it's that's it's really makes me think that U.S. strikes won't happen. So keep right. diplomacy. And the other the other point maybe worth mentioning is that you know if the U.S. does get involved in that way, uh, ISIS being more of you know an extremist organization that's just looking you know looking to get attention, looking to you know. So if we strike them on behalf of the Iraqi government or try to intervene in that way, that that may in fact make them that much more likely to want to set some oil fields on fire. Anything to sort of you know. Put uh, you know, stick the eye of the West, or you know, do something like that to get back. Uh, and so, to the extent that we're not involved, and it stays a, you know, local sectarian civil war, that uh, you know, that makes it uh, sort of leads to lower escalation, at least from an oil perspective, which is the primary perspective we're looking at. Right. And so, speaking of that um, escalation in terms of oil, right? Russia topped out the Russia situation with uh, Ukraine. Russia's the biggest oil producer, and that topped out at $104. So we have pierced that level. So it makes me think that Iraq, of course, matters to the market much more than Russia. So if you see that from your clients, you know, asking about Russia, let them know that look, don't even worry about Russia. Iraq's the real situation. Okay, so the, the, the bad, really bad scenario here, the, we saw the good and the bad, now the ugly. Uh, war engulfs the Gulf. And so the easy tell for this, you know, you'll know we're there, is the same way in the Vietnam War you knew things were really bad when, they, when um, the Tet Offensive happened, right? So same, same here. Uh, you'll know things are really bad if, Baghdad, if, we, if they lose Baghdad. That's basically it. And uh, there is a chance of that. You know, I'm, I'm able to articulate that uh, not alone, not with my huge imagination, because several pundits have said that. And so uh, if, if ISIS is able to get Baghdad, then, then you'll know that we're headed toward this ugly scenario. Uh, and that will also mean that the, their government is uh, gone. So, you know, not only, uh, uh, it, they're, they're already talking about, you know, with the U.S. involvement, changing the government. So this is actually just completely useless uh, military, completely useless uh, executive, et cetera. Right. So the big picture you want to look for is, is pictures like the one you see. You know, things on fire, bi uh, big picture oil fields on fire. You know, Absolutely. So there's, the, there's, the, there's a couple of different ways. I mean, if we really think about what are we talking about here, we're talking about will Iraq be able to keep oil production, you know, in the neighborhood of 3 million barrels a day, which is what they, roughly what they produce now. Uh, Libya, after going through its successful civil war and, and toppling uh, Gaddafi, their oil production fell very, almost to zero during the civil war, and then it bounced back. But because of ongoing sort of being a semi-failed state with different factions, their oil production still hasn't risen all the way back up. And so that could easily happen in Baghdad, whether it's Baghdad falling, whether it's uh, oil fields burning, if in the medium term to long term uh, there's no government stability or no central functioning uh, government, then you have a higher chance of oil going down from 3 million barrels a day of output, you know, down to 2, and then, you know, you take a million barrels off the market, you're really starting to push, push prices up. So that's the risk. In terms of in terms of how long this uh, war could play out, you know, if we're looking at, I forgot how Lib how long Libya was, Praveen. Maybe you know, Lebanon was uh, all of 15 years, and it's very much over now. Uh, you know, Le Beirut's probably the safest city in the Middle East, uh, and then next is Tehran, right this second. But 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 these things last. That could last a long time, you know. But we'll we'll show you later why it may not matter in terms of the in terms of our oil shock history in the U.S. How we've reacted. It may not affect us as much this time. In terms of an all-time high on oil prices, of course, that was July 2008 at 135 big ones. Uh, you know, we see it pop. You know, piercing that in a um, in a, if the sectarian uh, violence is completely metastasized uh, in in there, 
then uh, you know definitely above 150. Why is it not just piercing 135? Well, uh, you know the markets are have a lot more high frequency trading now, and so uh, it's kind of a crowd attracts a crowd like that. And so you know we see that 150 dollar number. You can, if you see if you look at the options activity, there is a good about of of um, of of bid items at at 150 dollars. Uh, so it's a very important level in options activity. This, we do want to distinguish this completely from the Iran situation or Iran scenario that's on hidden levers. You know, if there is a nuclear threat with Iran, that's very much uh, around its old um, kind of executive government dealing with I Iran, Israel, and the U.S., that stuff, that has nothing to do with this at all. In this, in this case, Iran is kind of, um, you know, it's a power player not uh, not the subject of the of the violence or or the, the kind of the troublemaker, um, it is it is completely separate than that nuclear idea. So just make sure you distinguish that. You know, probably your clients or just the lay person uh, on the street will just confuse all of these things together. But really, it's very distinguishable from any nuclear threat from Iran. Okay, but that is the worst case scenario we're looking at in uh, from this Iraq violence. Right, and let's look now at. Uh all, of, all three scenarios sort of in context are compared. If I could stick on the right slide for a moment there. So here we have the summary, and we're looking at uh, the macro macroeconomic impact of the three different scenarios. And I'll start with the good scenario up top. Then we've got the U.S. strike, sort of the, the bad, and then, of course, war engulfing the Gulf being the ugly scenario. Oil prices, as uh, Raj had sort of outlined and, and shown the technical levels on the chart, Coming back down to $94, $95 a barrel uh, if the conflict is contained, essentially where we, you know, where oil was resting or has been resting over the last couple of years, uh, absent this extra risk premium, that's, that's the likely outcome if, uh, if uh, the conflict is contained. Uh, this scenario is sort of, you know, outside of the impact on energy prices, it's sort of a, um, a sleep or a yawner just because... Uh, Basically, this is like, what if it never happened? What if the market just ignored it? So in and of itself, is this scenario going to cause the S&P to shoot to the moon? No. I mean, the S&P may shoot to the moon, but it won't be because of what happens or doesn't happen in the Middle East. Uh, you know, it, it's a lot of other factors controlling, controlling that. Uh, now, when we look at U.S. strikes, similarly, you know, you've got the impact, the positive impact on oil and, uh, you know, incremental positive impact perhaps on gold prices because there is a little more risk premium coming into the market, uh, but again, not too much potential downside on the S and P as you know as we projected it out because uh, again we're not moving the needle that much in terms of oil prices. We're not adding that much risk, and we've seen how the current market seems to uh, regard risk factors. It uh, you know it drops for uh, about an hour or two and then dismisses them. So uh, probably not in and of itself the catalyst for you know the big correction, it seems like that would be independent. Again, many reasons for a correction. I'm not implying the market's going to keep going up forever, but uh, it doesn't seem like either of these milder scenarios is, is sort of the catalyst. Now, when we talk about war engulfing the uh, Middle East or engulfing the Gulf states, you know, or really looking at the description there, what is this really about? This is about oil fields in southern Iraq, which is where the majority of oil, Iraqi oil production is. Or the the balance, you know, of major oil fields in Iraq. A lot of them are under Kurdish control in northern Iraq. Uh, if if either of those areas, you know, gets taken over by ISIS, or they manage to set oil fields on fire, as Saddam Hussein did, uh, that's where you see oil prices spike substantially. And uh, and so that's the real the real story here. Or for that matter, if ISIS were to somehow get down into the port cities or start blowing up oil pipelines, any of those sort of disruptive activities that knock out uh, part or all of that, 3 million barrels a day, which is a pretty big number. Just for context, uh, oil, overall worldwide oil production is between 85 and 90 million barrels a day. So you're looking at Iraq being a little more than 3% of world production. Uh, so taking all that offline at once would be a huge shock, and that's what would cause oil prices to jump. Uh, you had folks like T. Boone Pickens on CNBC talking about $200 oil. We are not projecting uh, that kind of, uh, kind of spike. But, oh, he's uh, got no bias whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, he's obviously he's got a little. So we're not talking our book, and so we're we're not looking at at, the, at those sorts of levels. But um, I had a question: How far out are we looking on these projections? Interesting question. Uh, 
the trouble with some of these geopolitical event-based scenarios is more that the you can't time when ISIS decides, ooh, it would be a good idea to go blow up some pipelines today. Uh, so, so in that sense, the, the time frame is harder to, to judge. But uh, generally speaking, I think these scenarios we're looking at, you know, this is all going to play out over the next six to, six to 12 months, most likely. If, if, we're, if it's locked in a sectarian war, like a civil war, much longer than that, then, you know, it's, it's likely just, uh, you know, going to lose the attention uh, of markets. And unless they're really crimping oil output, it, everyone will forget. Yeah, I mean, without 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 crimping oil p output, it becomes Iraq becomes another Syria to us. You know, I mean, is Syria affecting oil prices? Is there a premium for that? Not right. Really. Yeah. Initially, there was a premium when the Syria conflict first started, and then you saw it sort of bleed away. Nobody cared anymore. The Syrian civil war, sadly, has been going on for years, and it's quite it's a huge humanitarian crisis. But from a market perspective, nobody cares, and uh, that you know, would, would likely be the same here as long as it doesn't lead to material drop in oil production. And actually, you know, in terms of your clients, the things they worry about tend to be humanitarian. You know, they, they, they have an inability to distinguish humanitarian crises from market crises, right? And so the same way they'll be very affected because on the front pages of the news, uh, some kind of geopolitical thing, the same way that, uh, you know, at least, um, even in New York, you know, the people that didn't work in finance or didn't weren't directly affected by it in their portfolios, they just didn't have the the empathy there. And so uh, here, you know, because you're pos you're potentially managing emotions as well as money, it's it's important to just distinguish those and uh, you know take advantage of 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 being able to talk about both intelligently. The fact that it doesn't impact market, but you do understand the human crisis, and then you know that don't worry about things as much as you are, I've got it covered. You know, your normal kind of bedside manner part of your practice. Okay, so let's go to history here. Uh, we're talking about, you know, past Middle East oil shocks. We'll look at future ones. Uh, we've just looked at future ones. Uh, let's look at where past scenarios were, right? So here you for, you've got uh, several crises, um, the OPEC embargo that happened in the mid-70s, the Iraq revolution and kind of hostage crisis that happened in 1979. Um, you see the Arab Spring that happened uh, in 2011 with Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya kind of uh, coming out from under or trying at least. Um, in, the case of, in the case of Egypt, I'd say they're worse off today than they were uh, at that moment. Um, and then the, the, the two Iraq wars, um, you know, not counting whether the U.S. is involved or not in terms of the third one. Uh, but you can see there that in both in all those cases, you know, oil's kind of all over the place in terms of how far it's gone up. Uh, and uh, one thing is that the internal fighting, though, which we can tell from the two th the middle there, uh, Arab Spring, you know, that it, that didn't affect um, oil prices nearly as much as when there was international some kind of international conflagration, right? Some international heart attack happening just was way bigger a deal for oil prices than a contained um, internal problem, I'd say. Right? So you can see that that's the one insight you can make from these numbers. Right. Also in terms not, I'm ahead. just going to add to that. And it's not to say that that 2011 Arab Spring didn't take barrels off the market. It did. Libya was the one was the, of those countries, the, the one was a major oil producer. And they did, uh, you know, a million barrels of oil per day did come off the market. So it leads to some spike, but again, not like the others. Right, and well, the, basically the Suez Canal wasn't blocked off, so it wasn't like a bottleneck. That was the main thing. Um, you do see gold here uh, all over the place, also. Uh, so it's 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 really hard to get what the right analogy is <clears throat> in terms of gold prices. Uh, you know, with the uh, with the the in between the two Iraq wars, you can see what a difference that is. And so for us going into um, this this violence and this situation now. You know, uh, mapping out gold to us has much less to do with the individual geopolitical conflict as it does the kind of more macro picture around uh, deflation versus inflation, etc. Okay. Right. And so, uh, in terms of ten-year rates, you definitely see them. Um, you know, even as, as it was unaffected in the last Iraq War, and so uh, the, you know, it's really hard to to gauge from past oil shocks, all of them, how far. 
um, where oil could go. And so, you know, definitely uh, the the most recent, the Arab Spring, guides us in terms of in terms of oil movements. But if you notice during the um, during the presentation of the scenario analysis, we're very much about technical levels and uh, other things surrounding oil prices, as opposed to um, as opposed to these kinds of past oil shocks. You know, right. 20, well, you know, years Raj, the one the one big point the point I want to make on so the outlier number here in terms of oil price rise is this is the second Iraq war, uh, but let's also know that it's a very long time period. You know, of over five years. It was also the heart of the commodities sort of bull cycle. You had gold rising, you had, uh, of course, oil rising, agricultural commodities rising. Uh, it was also, uh, you know, of course, a, a bull equity. Oh, why market. don't you hop to the next slide, actually? Yeah, and so we, so we had a lot of factors there, you know, pushing that, as we'll see. Yeah, so as you're saying, you know, the, in, that, in that spike in 2000, uh, between 2003 and 2008, you know, there was some component of that that was Iraq-related. And the, the, even the downturn, you know, although you could say that the, the commodity bubble popped uh, into this just after July 4th, I believe, of 2008. And, you, you know, you did have a housing crisis at that time. You did have a financial crisis. So there are other external reasons. But it's, it's, um, it's, there is a fundamentals component to this and that is that George Bush announced the end of the drilling ban so you know the Iraq pumps kind of started again and that was it and and once that happened you know you had much more supply and normal supply demand kind of rules stepped in and so while you did have these macro factors which we're all about you did have some fundamentals leading to that and so it's part of the same kind of rise up um, with that huge rise uh, due to due to the second Iraq war um, in terms of the first Iraq War, you did have a uh, you know, 100 percent rise almost in um, in oil prices. Which re the second that um, the second that Iraq was out, you know, of Kuwait, the second that there was a kind of a smell of success to to the the end of that, that's when the retreat started. So in terms of a retreat here, uh, you know, when it starts to smell like success, uh, again, when when you see when you see any sort of unity in the government, you know, different. I mean, although from, from this far away, all Iraqis look the same to us, right? But it's a very factioned community. And so um, that kind of pluralistic society made up of, I don't know, uh, you know Arabs, Kurds, uh, and then these kind of northerners who, who are on the, want to get out of the, just kind of want their own country. If you can see them holding hands in a unified government, then that's the kind of smell we're looking for in terms of an oil retreat. So that would be really good. All right. Okay, well, but you know, the, if you look at if you look at where we were, all these all of these situations were in context of one big item, which is the U.S. had a growing addiction to oil, right? During all of these things, and we may be in an area now. We we definitely are where that is over. That addiction is over. Right. Let's let's move then to discussing the sort of supply and demand aspect of uh, the equation. So within the U.S., what's been going on, and. Uh, Based on that, how does that uh, how does it impact you know how an oil a new oil shock might might affect the U.S. today? Well, so on the left here we got two charts from the uh, Department of Energy. One is long-term U.S. field production of crude oil. So this is going all the way back to the 20s. This is basically the whole history of it, and you can see this spike. So we had an all-time high of 10 million barrels per day of oil production in the U.S., and that was in the early 70s, right around 1970 actually. Uh, and since then, we've been slowly but steadily declining, declining, declining until the fracking and shale oil revolution that's hit the industry over the last uh, really five to seven years. And we can see how fast oil production is recovering. Now, of course, high oil prices help, help stimulate you know, all that research and, uh, and also uh, enable the drilling. Uh, one thing to note is that if oil prices were to fall below $80 a barrel, most of this drilling you see at the end here, most of this rise in production would disappear because this, this new oil is expensive to get out of the ground. But at any rate, we've got oil production rising very fast in the U.S. And what's that doing to our need for imports? Well, we had imports as recently as 2006 uh, at an all-time high of 15 million barrels per day, and they have crashed downward down to uh, below 9 million barrels. We're just around God bless fracking. Those yeah, so all of that fracking, all of that uh, extra production is driving this down. But uh, those of you who are, who are looking at these graphs closely, you'll, you'll notice something. Production has only risen 
about maybe 3 million barrels a day from the lows, whereas consumption, or, or imports rather, have fallen twice that much. So something else is going on here, which we'll, which we'll look at. Uh, but one more note on, on production, and that's that uh, production has risen so much that oil companies have been quietly sort of petitioning. And they've been lobbying for a while for the ability to export uh, oil, but they also took a second angle, which is uh, under existing U.S. law, you can't export raw petroleum or, or crude oil, but you can export uh, finished products. And so what the oil companies have started to do is just really minimally process the oil. So do one little step. In the past, that might not have been approved as a refined product for export, but the White House uh, or the, the Department of Commerce, you know, so part of the administration, they just approved a couple of oil companies' applications to export oil after doing almost nothing to it. So basically, we, we've quietly lifted the ban on U.S. oil exports now that oil production is rising so rapidly. So that's a big sea change in the U.S. All right, so to that question of what else is going on, if we had a six and that's million... A, that's all without Alaska. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and well, what's interesting is that Alaska was the beast that, that drove our production up to these, the high levels in the 70s. Uh, nowadays, it's actually production in North Dakota and in, in, in Texas and in yeah, lower the bad 48. Lands. Yeah, it's the lower 48 that's, that, you know, and, and shale fracking that's driving it. All right, the, uh, but like I had said, only about half of the drop in U.S. imports, in fact, a little less than half, is due to rising production. The, the bigger factor that a lot of folks may not be familiar with is the other side of the equation. That's demand. So what's going on? Uh, well, the top chart shows U.S. average fuel economy. So fuel economy through the 80s and 90s was actually it was flat and it was actually slightly declining. From the early 80s when oil prices were high up into the late 90s, so around 20 years, uh, fuel economy was going down every year just a little bit. And what started happening with rising oil prices and with rising standards is that we saw a slight rise, and then over the last several years, we've seen a more substantial rise in fuel economy. And then, of course, the new government standards are pushing for 54 miles per gallon for new cars sold in 2025 on average, uh, which is, of course, way above what we have today. Now, now these numbers on this chart are uh, all existing vehicles, and so you've got some older, much less efficient vehicles in there, too. Uh, but the new government standards are so strict, this is going to continue to drive efficiency up pretty rapidly. And, uh, and, and that's going to take a bite out of oil consumption. So that's one piece of the equation. But then there's a second piece, which is that total U.S. miles driven since the peak in 2007 is actually down 3%. So I don't know who you thank for this. Do you thank Facebook for kids not even wanting to get their driver's license anymore? They just play on their phones and play on social media. Uh, <laughs> but whatever the reason is, uh, Americans don't drive as much as they used to, even though oil prices are relatively flat since the peak of oil, you know, uh, actually down from that peak in 08. Uh, meanwhile, yeah. GDP is up 7%. So it's not like this is just recession effects. Uh, G the overall economy has grown, but we're just driving less. And so you combine that might be tele That might be technology, too. Yeah, absolutely. It's technology. It's the ability to do what we're all doing today, which is having this meeting virtually. Uh, but the combination of less driving and better uh, miles per gallon those are combining to drive oil demand down 15% from its peak in the U.S. And you can see that here in the slide on the right. The expected line is just the um, Department of Energy just sort of like had forever, they had just sort of assumed that oil demand would rise in sort of this linear basis as the population grows, as driving grows. And instead what happened is we seem to have peaked and fallen, and, and this, this drop is actually pretty significant now. That's the 3 million barrels a day that we would be consuming that we are not. So pretty big difference there. And uh, what that means, you know, taking us sort of into the conclusion, is uh, perhaps we are uh, more immune to oil shocks than, than we've ever been. Yeah, we don't, need, we don't even need Iraq. And so as, as a recap of what we're talking about here, both the scenario section and uh, kind of this this uh, 101 on supply and demand of oil, et cetera, et cetera. You know, basically, if there is less consumption of oil, if there is this end to the oil addiction, um, then guess what? Maybe we could make better policy decisions, right? We've had horrible decisions made on the back of uh, this this grand need for oil. You know, they, you know, 
uh, it's not a conspiracy theory, really. People think the whole Iraq war was about that only, right about that. Uh, and for sure, you know, the reason Pearl Harbor got attacked was because Japan needed oil. They didn't get it. FDR didn't want to give it to them. They said, we'll, we'll attack you if you don't give us any oil, and they did. So horrible decisions and policy decisions have been made on oil for years. But if, if, if the United States doesn't have that addiction, then maybe we, we just stick to the same thing that um, the UK is, which is, hey, we definitely want to help diplomatically, but this is not our fight. See you later. And that's what we're hoping for, you know, that, that um, whatever, that, that lack of oil addiction guides the, uh, the administration's decisions and how they're behaving here. Uh, in terms of uh, where we are as a, you know, as a country, we're, we're, we can hang arm in arm with Iraq now because we're both oil exporters. You know, we're, we're part of the Players Club now, right up there. And uh, that, that photo on the bottom right, that's a famous photo from Life magazine in the, in the early 70s. You know, pretty much the uh, seminal photo symbolizing such an important part of American history, which is these oil shocks and, you know, how uh, that kind of changed from the, the great 60s, right? That's how it changed uh, into kind of the realities of, of the 70s. And so, um, but that's history. You know, definitely that's our past. Uh, because of uh, the data, what the data is telling us, both in terms of consumption and in terms of uh, production, it looks like the future for America is, is more like the Rockefeller era where we're a net exporter of oil. Um, the last bit, you know, until you see, until you see a ton of burning oil fields on, on the news, then Iraq is not exactly uh, something to write home about, you know, in terms of market stuff. So just look for... Look for big burning oil fields. That's the number one thing. Without right. that, you won't see oil crack 110. And just to expand Maybe. on the, on the point, you know, this idea of oil shocks being, you know, historical from a U.S. perspective. Imagine, it, you know, if you, if you want to imagine like a little deeper, uh, how it affects the economy. What if the U.S. produced enough oil that we weren't actually an oil importer anymore? We're, we're still a good ways away from that. But what if, you know, consumption is dropping, as we said in the U.S. Production is rising. What if those two lines met and we were a net zero economy in terms of when it comes to oil import-export? Well, what that would mean is that if oil prices doubled to $200 a barrel, then uh, because we are not buying it from outside of this country, all that's doing is uh, it's putting more money in the pockets of those states that produce oil, and it's taking money away from those states that don't produce oil. But the money is staying relatively speaking, within the United States. And, and so that's what we mean by oil shock being history. You would see, you know, an absolute hysterical boom in uh, Houston and Dallas if uh, oil prices went to $200 a barrel at the expense of, you know, other states, maybe East Coast, West Coast, elsewhere, that don't have that resource. But it, on an aggregate effect, uh, you know, in, on an aggregate basis across the United States, because you're, you know, net neutral, it wouldn't have nearly as much impact. So that's really what we're saying there. All right, let's move now to talk about energy exposure, good and bad. And here what we mean is, uh, well, you see the guy, apparently in Azerbaijan, they actually do, they, they pay that they do dips in pure crude. Not sure that's a good idea. So yeah, from they say it's good for your health. They say but, you know, don't, for, basically, don't always believe what you're told. Yeah, good for the skin, maybe, except for the heavy metals in it. Well, so the, uh, what we wanted to look at here was in terms of getting commodities or energy exposure within client portfolios, uh, to make sure, you, you know, we've, we've kind of told this story multiple times. We want to make sure that you guys don't end up in any of the bad oil investments that are out there. I think that more and more, we started ringing this alarm bell years ago. Uh, I think that much has been written on it since then. But uh, with certain commodities, it's easy to get physical exposure. With other commodities, it's not. So we're comparing here the example of oil and gold. Looking at oil ETFs, we, we've chosen a couple, you know, to pick on in terms of the oil, oil futures ETFs. Here in particular, we're looking at OIL and USO. And uh, during the oil spike, they did a pretty good job of giving you something approximating the returns of crude prices. But since 2009, I mean, absolutely abysmal. If you'd been... You know, if you'd been smart enough to go long energy, you know, at the at the bottom of the market, uh, but you did it using OIL or USO, you would have nothing to show for it. Whereas oil prices themselves, the actual all-time low was thirty-two dollars a barrel here, and so you're looking at an easy triple. 
So absolute outperformance versus, uh, you know, perhaps, you know, some of the major equities indices even. But when you look at it from these ETFs perspective, zero. I, I mean, I can't imagine many other asset classes where the tracking ETF was worse. And we're not talking about leveraged ETFs here. We're talking about ETFs that claim to give you one-for-one -one performance. And uh, actually, these ETFs have done so badly, they've been forced to change their prospectuses, you know, with, with regard to long-term holds and things like that. But you still see investors thinking that, oh, I can get oil exposure by buying these oil ETFs. Uh, and it's not just ETFs. There are funds that follow some of the same practices. And the bottom line is that what's happening to these funds is they buy oil futures and they're forced to continually roll over those investments and there's so much friction, they're losing so much money getting into the, the new futures, which is very similar to the options market. So buying the new ones every time that uh, they're effectively uh, just eating up any potential upside and that shows in the chart. Now on the other hand with gold, you have gold ETFs and gold funds that basically buy and store physical gold. IAU and GLD are two of the best known and we can look at this tracking chart on a percentage basis, they're giving you essentially perfect or as close to perfect as you can get gold exposure. The, the expense ratios on these funds are not particularly high either. And so uh, you're getting that kind of extraordinary performance that you see. Uh, so you can do that with gold. You can do it with silver and some of the metals. But you just can't do it with oil as the market exists today. Physical oil funds, they don't really exist. The problem, then the reason they don't exist is if you think about what it would take to have a physical oil fund, you'd have to either have super tankers full of oil sitting around in a bay somewhere or you'd have to have giant oil storage tanks holding this physical oil that you want to keep off the market. Uh, so it's difficult to hold. It's expensive. That would cost you a lot of money. It would lead to a high expense ratio. The second problem though is that it's not necessarily legal and uh, it, you know because the, the government, various governments including the US government look very dubiously upon investors that strangle a, a needed commodity. With gold, you could argue it's more of a trading commodity. It's more of a monetary commodity. Uh, but with oil, it's a, a needed commodity for people to actually be able to drive to work. And so uh, there's that issue yeah. as well. I hate hoarders. So, yeah, so not, not many good angles there. So instead, we wanted to introduce the idea of, okay, well, how do you in hidden levers find good investments uh, relative to oil if you do want oil exposure or energy exposure within your portfolio? And so this is where we want to talk about how to use the correlation screener to do that. Uh, what we included on the slide, and I'm just going to launch the screener in a moment, but on the slide we included a picture of the correlation screener and what settings you might use. So choosing screen by levers and then choosing oil as your lever. We're looking for positive correlation. And uh, here we, in this example we're looking at just ETFs and mutual funds. And that's actually enough. You can do that and hit the run button and, and get some results. And what we'll look at is, is what, what we're, by default, sorting these results by is this notion of oil impact or oil beta. Essentially, that you should think of it as the same way as S&P beta. What, is, what are these investments beta to oil? So if that beta is 1, that means that, roughly speaking, for every 1% upside in oil, you get a roughly 1% upside in that investment. Uh, but you'll find, and now if I go into the tool, we can look at it. So if I go into analytics and correlation screener, you'll find particularly when it comes to individual equities, you can find investments that have a much higher beta than one to oil, meaning that they give you leverage exposure to oil. So let's take a look for a moment here. And of course, this example is about oil, but you see how many different levers there are, and you can search across any of them to find exposure. So I'll run a screen just to share the example. And now let me scroll down and look at the results. Of course, I didn't add any screener uh, criteria, and so we're going to get a really big list at first, and then maybe we can filter it down. Uh, so this is including stocks, ETFs, and funds. And we see, not surprisingly, up at the top of the list, we see quite a few oil and gas exploration companies, drillers, things like that. Uh, what I find is interesting, you go a little ways down the list, but still with an oil beta much higher than one, and you will actually start to find some railroads. CSX, one of the largest railroad companies in the United States, and you can look over the last 10 years at its correlation to oil, or you know what the impact of oil has had, and, and look how tight that is. As oil prices rise, CSX has been doing absolutely great. Now, part of that is due to the fact that they actually ship a lot of oil. 
uh, because a lot of the oil boom in the U.S., that oil is being shipped by rail. But there's a second part to this story, which is that uh, as oil prices are high, trains are more competitive for shipping than trucks. And so they, they make money on it both ways. So just an example of what the screener lets you do. It's searching across industries and helping you find different investment ideas like that. Uh, in addition to directly using the screener like this, and of course we can tighten this screen up. I'll just add an example real quick. Let's say I want a minimum asset size, whether for a stock or fund, of $10 billion. Maybe I want a minimum yield. So let's look for investments that are $10 billion and above. And That's such low expectations, Praveen. You could put yeah. a higher well, you know, we want to keep keep some of the growth stories in there, but you know, you can you can come back through yeah. here, of course, and search for the high yield. If you're a yield hound, look for the high yield plays that also have that exposure to oil, or you can stick with searching by uh, by the exposure and so on. Maybe we want to actually flip it over and look for the lowest volatility. So now I'm looking for the lowest standard deviation, which also has a pretty high exposure to oil, and it, and it gives me this oil and gas pipeline company, Kinder Morgan. So just an example of how you can use that tool. But let's say you want a quick list of oil plays, and we don't even want to do much work. We also have the macro theme library right under analytics. And so I can drop in there, and we've created this high oil beta funds macro screen. So essentially, these are different ETFs and mutual funds which have a relatively high exposure to oil. And it, what's funny, what I thought was funny about this is that most of the results that turned up here are actually more general global hard assets uh, or even metals funds, but they happen to have a high correlation to oil. So that's another example of how we're looking off the beaten path. The fund doesn't have to have the word oil in it to show up in this list. It has to prove over time that it tracks with oil, and that's how you get these results. Yeah, so I would say ignore marketing and go for correlation. Right, exactly. And so, so the screener, or you know, you can look at this macro screen, and, and if you click see all results or on any of these macro screens, all it does is it runs the screener setup in the same way that uh, we used it in order to find some of those funds. And so you can do that and, and find the same. So that's an option as well. All right, okay. so let's go back now. And Raj, you want to talk about this in the context of inflation a little bit. Right. So, you know, what, if, if there's a theme we've been hitting on, um, you know, the day-to-day the -day data is one thing, but there are huge macro trends we see, uh, you know, at play, and that is all leading us to deflation. We've been talking about it for a few months, and to me, uh, you know, any of the little blips on the market, whether it's, whether it's uh, a, a tech bubble forming or, or certain geopolitical situations in Russia or Iraq, Really, the long-term picture is about deflation, and that's just, there's so many things at uh, play there. We've, we've highlighted um, the first world baby bust, and, and uh, last month we were talking about, uh, you know, our own, the U.S. kind of GDP growth uh, from winter, that sluggishness, and we've definitely talked about technology and automation and what those are doing, um, what those are doing to, to uh, in terms of the inflationary picture. But here, commodities is that issue, so I thought I'd highlight that too. Uh, there you're seeing just a CPI chart against oil prices. And so as long as inflation has been contained, you know, since that kind of 2010, 2011 period, uh, as much money as they've printed over the past few years, and they continue to, you know, quantitative easing is not over exactly, um, that's what's dominated oil prices movement. And so the question in the invitation was, is Iraq enough to get, to get out of this this deflation quicksand, if you will, and the answer to me right now at least is no. You know, that's why it, you that because of that quicksand force from deflation, you really haven't seen uh, you really haven't seen oil rocket past 110 uh, or 115 in this in this uh, sectarian violence situation. Right, you you've got so many deflationary forces. You've seen we see sub-zero rates in in Europe. We see our own interest rates here in the United States at roughly nil, and so that zero rate interest rate policy uh, is in multiple places around the world, in, and also Japan. So the whole first world is in a deflationary state, evidenced by where interest rates are, and um, and so how can oil ever get out of that grasp? That is a much bigger mover of oil prices long term 
than than a blip in in Iraq to me. And so that is the you know that deflation has completely trumped geopolitical worries, and that's why you didn't see it move that much even in the Russia Russia situation, right? Although Russia is the biggest producer of oil, and that becomes vulnerable, etc. Uh, deflation trumps that, and that's the quiet beast that's always lurking here. You know, for the reasons listed in these kind of thoughtful pictures on the left, but today highlighting the sinking, com you know, what commodity sinking are uh, more a another evidence uh, that deflation is at play. So just keep that in mind. You know, deflation is a much bigger deal than sectarian violence in Iraq to oil prices. Okay, well, you know, summing up in terms of the use cases, we've already looked at um, the scenario on site. You want to show them that? Sure, absolutely. We've, we've so let's, let's seen a couple a of those things, the macro theme and all that. Yeah. Why don't we take a look at the actual scenario online? Yeah, so if we go into the scenario library, in the trending uh, area, we have Middle East turmoil. And so you can drill in there, and you can see that we have the three different uh, scenarios, along with the historical scenario on the Arab Spring. The other oil shocks, uh, as it comes to historical, we have, uh, you know, the, the Iran, or under the Iran scenarios. So you have, you know, one of those is... More Iran driven. And we don't want to put those all here. You know, there's a difference. We get asked, especially by our hedge fund clients, uh, you guys are kind of thin on the historical scenarios. Well, you know, as you know, most hedge funds fail, so it's not like we're taking advice from hedge funds. But 